Aloha and welcome. We are so pleased that you are joining us this evening for the 2020 Honolulu Prosecutor Candidate Debate, proudly presented by Hawaii Women Lawyers. HWL is a nonprofit organization committed to improving the lives and careers of women lawyers, influence the, influencing the future of our legal profession, enhancing the status of women, and promoting equal opportunities for all. My name is Louise Ng. I am a partner in Honolulu with the law firm of Denton's and a longtime member of HWL. I am honored to serve as the moderator tonight. Over the next hour, we will hear from all seven of the Honolulu prosecutor candidates on their plans and policies to address important issues that directly and substantially impact women and children in our community. The primary election takes place on August 8th, with ballots being mailed to registered voters on July 21st. Um, in an order determined by random drawing, the candidates are Anosh Yaku. He is a practicing lawyer. He previously ran for Honolulu prosecutor in the 2016 election and was incumbent Keith Kanishiro's only opponent. Um, our second candidate, Jackie Esser. She is a career public defender. According to Jackie, she has spent more than a decade working to reform the criminal justice system, giving crime victims a voice in every case and investing in our communities to make them safer and just. So that's safer and more just. Um, the third candidate, Steve Alm. Stephen Alm is a former Hawaii State Judge, Honolulu Prosecutor, and United States Attorney. According to Steve, he has the experience and integrity we need to clean up the prosecutor's office and make Honolulu safer. The fourth candidate I'm introducing is Megan Cow, a former deputy prosecutor and current practicing attorney. According to Megan, as prosecutor, she will use her skill, experience, and knowledge to restore integrity to the office and earn the respect of the community by fighting for justice for those who cannot fight for themselves. Our fifth candidate is Dwight Natamoto, the acting prosecuting attorney for the city and county of Honolulu. According to Dwight, he is a law and order prosecutor who will be tough on crime and his priority as prosecutor will be locking up violent criminals. Our sixth candidate, RJ Brown. He is a former deputy prosecutor and current practicing attorney. According to RJ, he is running because the criminal justice system must be reformed. He pledges that his administration would champion smart, efficient, and responsible prosecution. Finally, our seventh candidate is Tai Kim. He is a practicing criminal defense attorney. According to Tai, his mission is to change the culture of complacency and closed door meetings so that elected officials serve in the best interest of all people. We are excited to present this opportunity to hear from the candidates on these critical issues. Before our broadcast began, we went over some basic ground rules, including common courtesy and taking turns to answer one at a time and to ensure our viewers can easily hear everyone's responses and get the most out of today's event. Each candidate will be given approximately one minute to respond to each of the questions presented. At the end of the question rounds, each candidate will have a ch chance to give a short, concise closing statement. So without further ado, Let's get to the questions. So the first question, the first answerer of the question is gonna be Anosh, and the first topic is domestic violence. A recent city audit showed that nearly 40% of murders in Hawaii are related to domestic violence, and domestic violence makes up a significant portion of violent crime in Hawaii. At the same time, recent administrations have imposed controversial no-drop policies which prohibit these cases from being dropped, even if a victim later withdraws his or her complaint or no longer wants to testify. Reportedly, this policy leads to more case dismissals and acquittals while utilizing valuable state and city resources. So the questions are, as prosecutor, would you maintain the no drop policy for domestic violence cases? And what would you do to achieve better outcomes in domestic violence cases? both in terms of protecting victims and providing treatment or punishment to offenders. Anosh? Oh, I wanted to say hello to everyone and thank you to Hawaii uh, Women Lawyers for hosting this forum. We pre I appreciate it and I appreciate you inviting me. Um, I'd like to start out by saying uh, 
thank you to everyone. I'm sorry. So this is about no drop policy about domestic violence cases. Right. In situations where the victim has decided not to want to pursue the prosecution. Yes, as I explained before, the policy is that uh, no drop policy includes that uh, consists of prohibiting cases from being dropped, even if the victim later withdraws his or her complaint or no longer wants to testify. I find that to be very uh, problematic. I would not pursue that. I mean, I'm not in favor of that. I believe that you do need to have victims to meet the burden of proof. And d domestic violence situations are fluid. You know, oftentimes these are dysfunctional situations and you can't, you can't, things change. You can't just lock yourself in uh, and say, no, we're definitely pursuing this and going forward if you have a victim who has decided that they didn't want to continue with it. That's my view of it. Thank you, Anoush. Our next, uh, the next person who will answer is Jackie Esser. Thank you. Please. Domestic violence will be one of my top priorities. I will realign the office resources to focus on the very serious violent crimes, the crimes that matter most to our families and, and communities. And this includes crimes of domestic violence. We have to empower victims of violence to have control over their futures and the case while providing them access to the services they need. Victims have to be centered. Too often, victims are patronized by conviction-hungry prosecutors told to play their role in seeking a conviction. Under my administration, on day one, within 24 hours of a police uh, conferring the case with the prosecutor's office, we will reach out to the victim, help coordinate services in the community to provide emergency housing, shelter, food, job resources, whatever the case may be, to not have to wait to get a conviction. Um, as you said, that most of these cases are not resulting in convictions and we have to change that and the focus has to be on providing meaningful support and restorative justice. Thank you, Jackie. Stephen Alm is next. Thank you. Uh, this is an extremely difficult area, and I have focused on domestic violence uh, for much of my career. I did those cases as a deputy prosecutor. I then supervised that section. I did domestic violence homicides. And as a judge, that's where I spent my first two years on the bench. What you're going to have to do is decide, is the victim dropping, wanting to drop the case because uh, she has decided that's safer for her kids and her family, leaving her husband or boyfriend who's abusing her is the most dangerous time, or is she getting pressured uh, by him to do that? Uh, secondly, uh, I, I, I would convene a working group of the most knowledgeable people to try to proceed, and that includes people like Lynn McGivern, people like uh, Nancy Creedman, uh, Loretta Sheehan, uh, Jan Tamora. It's, it's trying to look around the country and see, are there better ways to do this than what we're currently doing? This has been important. I fought as a prosecutor to make uh, ma manslaughter a 20-year felony rather than a 10-year. We fought the public defenders tooth and nail and finally became law as a 20-year felony. That's what it should be if the defense is successful in getting a murder knocked down to manslaughter. So this has always been a priority. I will work, we'll train the deputies to be more effective in court so we can be more effective in whatever way we choose to handle it. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Megan Cow. Thank you. First of all, I am a domestic violence victim survivor. I know exactly what domestic violence victims go through before they're subpoenaed, and that is very difficult to deal with. Secondly, a domestic violence victim can be male or female. Nowadays, it doesn't matter. There are male victims and there are female victims. Lastly, what I would do is I would use empathy to guide the victim through the system. Right now, that's not what happens. I will have the deputy sit down with the victim, whether it's a he or she, and we will explain the, the criminal justice system to him or her and guide him or her through the system so that they have a full understanding of what's gonna happen next. I understand they might be recanting, but we will move through the system anyways. And that's because the suspect needs to face consequences. Thank you, Megan. Dwight Naramoto. Domestic violence has always been important to me. The problem is batterers control the courts. What we have done so far 
is that I have hired the preeminent domestic violence prosecutor in the United States from Queens, New York. He has been training my deputies since the beginning of the year. His methods of prosecuting domestic violence have been um, taken up by the federal government. And he has taught domestic violence prosecution all over the United States. With his help, we have put in a bill to make domestic violence easier to prosecute. Um, it would allow um, the, the, the case to go forward without the victim. What would happen is that a body cam would take a statement from the victim at the very beginning. You would be able to see the, the emotions on the victim. You would be able to see her looks, the way she's crying or whatnot. And that would come in as an ex to, uh, to rebut any recantations she might make later. This bill passed unanimously through the Senate and was one vote short of being unanimous in the House. Unfortunately, at the 11th hour, this bill got killed. But we are taking a proactive case in prosecuting domestic violence. It is very important to me that batters should no longer be able to control the situations frustrating the victims again and again. And that's why they recant. We must stop that. Thank you, Dwight. RJ Brown. I would not uh, retain the no drop policy only because I, I tend to think that uh, any type of broad brush, po broad brush policy leads to bad results in certain situations. In the criminal justice system, you have to take cases uh, on a case by case basis. You've got to understand the individual circumstances of each uh, charge that you're dealing with. Now that said, um, far too often when you've got a domestic violence situation, uh, the victim in that case is terrified that she has to go back or he has to go back to the abuser, to the spouse. And um, it may be easier or there may be an incentive for him or her to just say, listen, I don't wanna do this. I just wanna make things right and, and let's get back to peace and calm. Uh, but the, the, the problem is it doesn't lead to that. It, it, it oftentimes escalates to worse and worse situations. And so, yes, you have to take the victim's desire to go to court uh, into account. It's obviously an incredibly important feature. Uh, but at the same time, you have to keep in mind that your job is to protect this person and you have to lead them through this process and you have to make them understand um, that by taking this difficult road of getting on the stand, looking your accuser in the eye and identifying him or her and saying, this person beat me and hurt me, um, that you're going to make yourself safer. And we need to uh, deal with these abusers in a much more severe way than we have been. They do control the system, uh, as Mr. Nadamoto said. They have been playing the courts with defense attorneys and they know that victims are oftentimes not gonna show up. Um, and so you've got to improve training within the prosecutor's office. The prosecutors have to be able to learn how to go to trial uh, without these victims on occasion or to use other types of evidence or to use hearsay exceptions or whatever we have to do. Um, but I would not retain the policy. That said, my general inclination is to always go to trial uh, on these matters and ensure that we get justice to the best of our ability. Thank you, RJ. And finally, Ty Kim. Thank you. Domestic violence uh, are, un unlike many other criminal offenses, uh, it's, it involves person that a defendant knows, offender knows a partner, spouse, girlfriend, boyfriend, what have you. So it's very, very sensitive area. We need to uh, be doubly sensitive in prosecuting these cases. But I am in support of no drop, no drop policy because what happens when there's a, you know, oftentimes an offender gets arrested and they get arraigned. And soon after they get, they post a bail, they get released. And so they're accessible to the victim and especially if there's a children involved with the domestic violence cases. A lot of, there's a lot of emotions, a lot of things, a lot of elements at play. And we cannot have offenders or victims dictate criminal justice system. We cannot have offender, and especially the offender, but oftentimes with the victims too, to control whether or not it should be prosecuted or not because domestic violence like any other crime, it's a societal uh, in, uh, infringement. You know, we are protecting the public at large. It's not just the victim that prosecutor's office is representing. We're representing all crimes that are happening on the island of Oahu, protects everybody. So it's a societal breach. We cannot um, have offenders or, 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 or the victims uh, compromise that. So I am in support of it in terms of, um, better outcome, there has to be a better counseling available uh, for the victim and the defendant. In civil cases, we have mediation. You know, for criminal cases, something like domestic violence, when, when there's an offender that really knows or close to the victim, 
we need some sort of a counseling, joint counseling to resolve it so that it doesn't happen again. There has to be understanding as far as the sentencing outcomes. You know, that too can be modified so that the offender get, gets a second chance. So, so it's not all about criminal convictions and incarceration, but we need to work on mediation, working it, working it out together so that the future offenses does not occur. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. Okay, the next set of questions, Jackie will be the first one to answer. The next topic is sex trafficking. And again, I'll set the context and then ask the question. Over the past decade, it has been increasingly apparent that sex trafficking is a very serious and long overlooked problem on Oahu which threatens the safety of our children and erodes the sanctity of our island communities. Historically, law enforcement has addressed the problem by cracking down on so-called prostitutes, usually women and children, either one, proceeding with prosecution, potentially treating many victims of sex trafficking as criminals, or two, requiring victims to assist in investigations and testify against their traffickers before they be can, be, can be given immunity and actually be treated as a victim. So the questions are, if elected, would you give immunity to sex trafficking victims, even if they're unwilling or unable to testify? And if so, how would you hold pimps accountable for their actions? In addition, what steps would your administration take to address the ongoing demand for prostitution, which is what drives sex trafficking in the first place? Jackie Esser. Yes, I will not prosecute sex workers. Prosecuting sex traffickers will be one of my top priorities. And again, I will realign the office resources to focus on the very serious violent crimes, and this includes sex trafficking. In order to combat it, we must have a victim-centered approach that supports victims of sex, sex trafficking to cooperate with police and law enforcement. And this is why I will not prosecute sex workers. We want to support people in sex work who want to engage in sex work because certainly our economy does not work equally for everyone. The people to prosecute are not those who have gone down the path of sex work and have survival needs like housing and food. We absolutely need to prosecute the people who really profit from sex work. The individuals who cause a lifetime of harm to our children, our women, our trans women of color, and who ensnare people in sex work and abuse sex workers. That is the only way to combat sex trafficking and prosecute these people have to have an open door so sex workers can come to law enforcement and work with the prosecutors and identify the people causing harm and trafficking our children and our women and uh, our LGBTQ plus communities. This is how we will be able to prosecute the real criminals, the sex traffickers. Thank you, Jackie. Stephen Alm. Uh, I absolutely will focus on sex trafficking. When I was the United States attorney, we prosecuted seven pimps for sex trafficking. We worked with the, with the victims uh, in the sex trade, they're the ones who came uh, and talked to us, said they wanted help. We were able to hold the defendants in custody until their trial. They went to prison for several years. Many of the seven were able to go back to their lives before that. Uh, in the last year, I have taken three training courses to educate myself further about this, particularly about child uh, sex trafficking, and there's no such thing as a child prostitute. That is a rape victim. And I've gotten to know the, the good folks at Ho'ola Napua, led by Jessica Munoz. Uh, they're building a 30 bed facility on the North Shore so people have a safe place to go for so sex trafficking victims. Shah Talebi has been hired by the Attorney General's office as a statewide coordinator for human trafficking. He has done these cases in Washington state and will be a great resource in training prosecutors and public and uh, law enforcement officers in how to do these cases successfully. So it is gonna take a full court approach to do this. But as a prosecutor, Honolulu prosecutor, I'd be cooperating with the attorney general's office, with the liquor commission, with the United States attorney's office and be a full player wanting to work with everybody else to address this problem. I wanna make Hawaii a very uncomfortable place for sex traffickers. And it takes a tough prosecutor to do that. We will successfully do these cases, send those folks to prison. These are our daughters, our nieces, who are getting 
uh, brought into this world. I, I got a, a message from a woman at uh, Farrington High School. She was a teacher. She had worked on Weed and Seed with me. She said, we've got this problem in our school. Come help us get elected. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Megan Cow. Yes, I will provide immunity for the sex trafficking victim. In 2009, I was the first deputy prosecuting attorney in the state of Hawaii to try a promoting prostitution in the first degree, State versus Joseph Vaimili. Lori Whalen was the victim. And when we arrested Joseph Vaimili, she did not want to prosecute him. And I understood this because at certain times, she was madly in love with him. And at other times, she was deathly afraid of him. And she was on the mainland. And so I had to talk with her by phone. And it was very difficult to create a rapport with her. But we did it. And we were able to bring her back to Honolulu to testify against Joseph Aimili. And this girl had been through major abuse. Joseph Aimili had taken her down a crowded alley in Waikiki and beat her in front of a number of people. He had thrown her hundreds of times into, an, into a shower naked and wet and whipped her with a leather belt. He then took her to the North Shore and held her by gunpoint and threatened to kill her. And still, she did not want to testify against Joseph Aimili. But we got her to testify by guiding her through the system, having empathy for her and explaining to her what she should expect and how the criminal justice system works. And we got a guilty verdict and Joseph Aimili sits in prison where he belongs today. Thank you, Megan. Dwight Nadamoto. Uh, thank you. Um, sex trafficking cases, which I have done, we always look at giving the victims immunity. We are only looking at prosecuting those who profit from sex trafficking. And normally when we talk about our victims, we do not mention their names. Uh, let me, we currently right now have a sex trafficking task force that includes Homeland Security, HPD, Coast Guard, Borders, Cust FBI, Susanna Wesley. Whenever we go into a, a brothel or whatever, we always take service providers and we try to hook up any victims with them. One of the cases that I have prosecuted concerns Wei Li. Wei Li was a Chinese national who provided fake documents for Chinese women to come to a, the United States. He would charge them maybe $10,000, which none of them could afford. Because they couldn't afford it, he would later place them in brothels. We were able to prosecute him because we gave immunity to some of those individuals who he had uh, placed in those brothels. Wei Li at that time had moved to Los Angeles. We charged him with uh, RICO. We charged him with promoting prostitution in the first degree. He was extradited to Honolulu. He pled and he was deported. So we are always looking to prosecute sex traffickers. Thank you, Dwight. RJ Brown. And, uh, you know, again, I, I will not say in every situation that I'm going to provide immunity um, in these situations, but uh, the law currently prohibits both the uh, practitioners and the providers of, of sex trafficking trade. And so I think you've got to uphold the law the way it's written. Uh, now that said, I'm obviously not in the business of, of trying to re-victimize a victim. And so um, if we have a sex trafficking victim and we can um, give him or her immunity uh, to, uh, to testify against uh, a pimp uh, that's involved in the case, that's certainly something that we're going to do. We want to give her the services that she needs uh, to hopefully get out of that cycle and get out of that life. And, and that would be a priority of mine. Um, obviously, you want to go after these cowards and these disgusting people that are propagating the trade. And so you do work with the federal government. Uh, the prior administration has been extremely adverse to working with the federal government. Uh, and so I would like to use uh, work with the U.S. attorney out here and make sure that we can uh, target these pimps and we can uh, you know, prosecute them to the fullest extent of the law. Because ultimately, that's what we've got to do. That's the job. And that's how you're going to disincentivize um, the, the, the trade. Um, we also have to be looking at the johns. I mean, you can't just ignore them. I mean, this is a supply and demand issue. So you've got to go after the demand, but you've got to go after the supply as well. Um, so it's, it's a multifaceted, multifaceted thing. Thank you, RJ. Ty Kim. Thank you. As far as victims concerned, of course, definitely. Whether victims are too afraid to cooperate or not, uh, immunity. We cannot re victimize the victims, number one. Number two, immunity for victim, of course. Uh, number two, 
contempts full extent of the law, state law, federal law, full extent of the law. They have to be accountable. It, they have to be, there has to be serious accountability and consequences. You know, we cannot, whether it's a first offense or second offense, whether it's the first time they got caught or not, full extent of the law. As far as uh, reducing sex trafficking, it, it takes education. We need to inform the public at large of the impact that it has on our society, on our community, on our daughters, on our mothers, on our sisters. We have to educate the public the impact of it, of, of sex trafficking. People need to be aware and we need to reduce the demand for it. So long as there's a demand for it, pimps will supply it, whether they will be illegal, illegal immigrants or, or not, or uh, some girl down the road, some runaways, some juvenile delinquents, pimps will target so that they, they can't have the supply. We gotta cut off the demand. And that's through education, that's through community involvement, and that's through we all working together to, to let the people know what's happening. Let the people be aware and be conscious about it. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. And finally, Anosh. I would, uh, I'm gonna keep this brief. I agree with much of what many people have said. Emphasis should be on prosecuting the traffickers, not prosecuting the victims, not prosecuting uh, <coughs> people who have been trafficked who are caught in this cycle. Uh, I agree generally with the idea that we don't want to re-victimize the victim. Uh, as far as immunity goes, I am in favor of providing them with immunity, and I am generally reluctant to use it as a kind of coercive tool. Uh, you know, if we're only giving immunity if they decide to testify against the trafficker, I'm not sure. I'm not sure that that's uh, something I would be eager to do. I, I'd be very reluctant with that. Thank you. Thank you, Anosh. The next topic we're gonna to cover is victims' rights. And again, I'll set the scene and then we'll ask the question. And the first person to answer is gonna be Stephen Alm this time. Many believe our current criminal justice system often re-victimizes victims of crimes through long drawn out uh, criminal uh, proceedings, lack of communication, lack of ability to provide meaningful input and having to recount over and over the sometimes humiliating or traumatizing circumstances of their victimization. Meanwhile, defendants may strategically drag things out, which not only makes things increasingly difficult for victims, but actually extends the dynamic of power and control that offenders may have over their victims. In recent years, there has been some movement to recognize the critical role that victims play and implement more trauma-informed processes. Yet we continue to hear about cases in which victims feel ignored, confused, or taken for granted sometimes even by the agencies tasked with assisting them. So the questions are, what types of victims' rights and services do you think are essential and how would you implement them? What would you do to minimize the trauma on victims throughout the investigation and prosecution of a case? And Stephen Alm. Well, the, the process needs to be more victim-driven. There's no question about it. I've worked with victims the entire 16 years I was a prosecutor. When I was the United States Attorney, I hired May, May Chun, then May Wine, to really improve our, the victim services at the United States Attorney's Office. She's well known in the victim's rights community. She was number two at the prosecutor's office. Uh, and part of it is, is making them a, a central part of it. So they're communicated with, they're listened to, uh, they're supported. I think what has been happening in this in the sex uh, assault arena where a victim is taken for a one-stop shop to get interviewed once and then the, a deputy prosecutor should be working with them once the same thing should be happening in, in the domestic violence arena I think that was the the whole purpose of that center that got started before it went off track uh, by the prosecutor's office and became essentially a, a jail for victims. Uh, but that the original idea was very good as far as making it a one-stop shop for those victims. Uh, I, I have always tried to uh, place victims' concerns right at the forefront. And part of that is treating everybody with courtesy and respect as a judge. I was known for that. 
whether it was defendants and trauma and for care, most of the women on probation and in, uh, in prison have been traumatized. Many of the men have as well. I've learned a lot about that from Lauren Walker, from going to her classes, going to the women's prison, participating uh, in those activities, and learning about it. So we can, we can do better for victims, we will. We'll get the deputies to understand how important that is. And the, dep and the victims can help them win cases as well. So uh, I look forward to doing that if I get in as the Honolulu prosecutor. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Megan Cow. The first thing I would like to note is that it is very old school and discriminatory to continue to refer to victims as she. If you are a relevant lawyer and you are active in the criminal justice system now, we know that victims can be males or females. And nowadays, there are many males that are victims of many different crimes, male on male, female on male. And so if you're out of touch with society and what's going on, you should not be running for a prosecuting attorney. Also, I believe that communication is key. It doesn't mean just sending out a subpoena in the mail or sending an email out. It means having the deputy prosecuting attorneys sit down with the victim, talk with him or her, explain the justice system to him or her. It is very difficult to maneuver through the criminal justice system if you've never been there before. And lawyers have a specialized knowledge that we can share with everybody. And that includes and is especially true for the victims. They get subpoenas and they show up for court and they're wondering, do I have to stay here? What's going on? Who's going to talk to me? They are giving no information. We need to do a better job of calling them in, meeting with them, answering their questions, being accessible to them. And that means answering the phone every single time they call. Thank you, Megan. Dwight Naramoto. So my office has always been about victims. Whenever there's a potential plea, whatever's going on the case, we always contact the victim. It can be a victim of a sex assault. It can be a victim of a rape mob. When we um, did our sex trafficking task force, one of the things we did is we contacted the sex abuse treatment center and they were able to give our members um, training. Um, what that training causes, trauma informed training. So when they are um, talking to a potential uh, sex trafficking victim, they know that sometimes their reaction to them is not based upon hostility to them, but upon the pain of which they have um, experienced throughout their life. We are always looking at victims. Victims are what we focus on. And one of the things we try to do it's like about, what, three months ago, we had that COVID-19 thing. Victims, victims were not being informed. We tried to inform them as much as we could. But unfortunately, courts would just let them out, no hearings. And, you know, at, at least half of those people um, who were released, um, I mean, hundreds were released. About more than 25% of them have been rearrested. So we are always about victims, keeping them informed, letting them know what's going on. Thank you, Dwight. RJ Brown. You know, most of the uh, most of the candidates in this race are defense attorneys. They've either been defense attorneys for all or the vast majority of their careers. And 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 that's fine. They've dedicated themselves to representing the defendants. They are a necessary and important part of the criminal justice system. But um, but I'm a prosecutor. I, I got into this business to represent victims. That's what motivates me. That's what I want to do. And, um, you know, the reality is uh, we have fallen short. We have fall short every single day of making sure that we are uh, doing our job and keeping the victims up to date with cases. And so if elected, um, you know, what I would do first and foremost is make sure that prosecutors after every single uh, court setting, whether it's to set a trial or talk about a continuance or talk about motions, they need to maintain constant contact with the victims of crimes. Uh, they, I found, I believe I'm probably the only candidate here that's actually represented the state in a criminal trial uh, in the last four or five years. And um, what I found is that victims get most frustrated when, they, when they're out of the loop when they don't understand what's going on. Because, you know, people get it. The criminal process is complicated and difficult. And, you know, they're, they're, they're willing to work with you. But you've got to have that dialogue. You've got to keep them informed as to what's going on. And so all deputies will be instructed to work with the victims every single time. Pick up the phone and call people. Let them know what's happening. Uh, beyond that, within the prosecutor's office itself, we have victim advocates. Uh, I would double the size of that division. We've got to make sure that we have trained professionals who understand the complexities and nuances and how to deal with victims. Um, and we would significantly increase the funding and, and, and uh, make that happen. 
Thank you, RJ. Ty Kim. This delayed is definitely justice denied. You know, you don't want to re-victimize, as, as you have asked, to prolong the prosecution in favor of the defense. Defendants have right to speedy trial under our constitution. Victims should have right to speedy trial as well. What happens is defense counsels would delay it, whether it's intentional or not, they would delay it. What happens? Victims would just wait around for trial. Judges have to be mindful of not continuing it, not delaying it, and consider not just the defendant's rights to be prepared for trial, but victim's right to be heard. Victim is waiting to be heard. We must do more to take care of the victims who have been victimized. And if you delay it, we are in fact re-victimizing them. This has to be told and informed to the court. There has to be a policy, not just for the defendant to have a right to speedy trial, but for victims to have a right to a speedy hearing, speedy trial for the victims as well. Although it's not in the constitution that victims should have a right to speedy trial, we should have a policy. We should have a discussion with the public. People need to be aware of what's happening. Every one of us have a duty and obligation to inform the public of what's happening and what's not. Why we are delaying these cases. And oftentimes what happens with delays, victims would just move on without having their voices heard. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. Anosh Yaku. Hello. Yes, I would echo most nearly everything everyone has said. We need better communication, better witness victim advocacy. Uh, I believe that expanding, you know, that division would be helpful and would be good. Um, I can't say that I disagree with any of this, and I would agree with Ty Kim. Justice delayed is justice denied. Uh, I, I agree most nearly with everything everyone has said. Thank you, Anosh. And finally, Jackie Esser. We shouldn't have to wait for a conviction to provide support to a crime victim. The reason why we must invest in our communities and families is in crime prevention and not jails and prisons is that stronger families and communities means less poverty, means less mental illness and substance use disorder, and allows prosecutor resources to focus on prosecuting the most serious violent crimes, as well as providing meaningful support on day one of an incident for crime victims. We absolutely have to change the culture of the prosecutor's office. It cannot be about conviction rates. Instead, we have to focus on how well we are healing the harm that crime causes and the rates of recidivism. And we can do that in a number of ways. But as far as crime victims are concerned, the policy and the culture needs to not re-victimize victims and wait until a conviction to provide support. Um, and that takes collaboration. So prosecutors on day one, when a case is brought for conferral for charging, must be working and collaborating with appropriate community-based organizations to, again, give the crime victim support. Is it money? Is it housing? Is it food? What is it? And work with these agencies and the victim on day one to provide these things. Uh, policies, the, cur the current policies of the prosecutors, like asking for bench warrants when victims don't decide, decide after they've been dragged through this uh, corrupt system that they no longer want to be a part of it, only re-victimizes. We have to help and support victims piece their lives back together. And there has to be meaningful support. We have to change the culture. We have to, and under my administration, every crime victim will be offered the opportunity to participate in restorative justice. Um, every victim has a voice and it, it, we must focus on, on that voice and, and ask victims what do they truly need to start healing from the harm that the crime has caused them. Thank you, Jackie. Um, and so the next person who will go first is Megan Cow, and we're going to have the next topic be on racial disparity. Um, I should note too that I was informed that our bell stopped working and so um, everybody's been great about keeping within time, so we'll have to just have honor system on keeping within our minute. 
Um, racial disparity, the context is that race, recent national events, as everyone knows, have starkly demonstrated the racism and inequalities that permeate our nation's justice and society, justice system and society. While Hawaii's ethnic makeup and history are unique, studies have clearly shown a disproportionate representation of Native Hawaiians and other minorities in our criminal justice system. So the questions are, do you believe this is due to systemic institutionalized racism or due to more subtle implicit bias or due to other reasons? And how would your administration address these issues, including the public's perception of police violence, misconduct, and systemic racism? And the first person to answer will be Megan Cow. I believe that the disproportionate numbers are due to other reasons. They are not due to police misconduct such as racism. I do not believe that police officers intentionally go and target Hawaiians versus non-Hawaiians. I was born and raised here. We were, we were raised with not knowing color. We were so diverse that most people that were born and raised here do not discriminate in that manner. And most of the police officers are local and from here. In order to address the disparity, however, a prosecutor needs to be a community leader. The only thing a prosecutor can do is objectively apply the criminal laws to everyone. It is not just to say, I as the prosecutor, am only gonna prosecute non-Hawaiians or because I'm local, I'm only gonna prosecute non-locals. That's not just and it is not fair. And anyone that promises that leads to corruption because once a prosecutor decides to start choosing who to prosecute and who not to prosecute, and what charges to prosecute and what charges not to prosecute. That leads to corruption. The next prosecutor will say, well, that prosecutor chose not to charge Hawaiians, so I'm gonna decide not to charge Chinese people, or I'm gonna decide not to charge Japanese people. You cannot do that. But what a prosecutor can do is be a community leader. Go out and be a good example. Bring these issues to light. Talk to people, educate the legislature, so that the legislators know where to spend the money because legislators are not familiar with the criminal justice system. City Thank you, Council. Megan. Thank you, Megan. Um, the, the minute goes by really fast. So Dwight Nadamoto. You know, we support cultural awareness. We support giving Native Hawaiians every opportunity, education, whatever it may be. We want them not even to get in to the criminal justice center. But once somebody comes into the criminal justice center, we evaluate case culturally blind. We base our decisions on the evidence. Now, I know some people may agree or disagree with me, but um, you know, I have I have prosecuted police officers. I prosecuted a Honolulu police officer who was the leader of a burglary ring in Hawaii Kai. I prosecuted him. I did the appeal argument before the Supreme Court and won. And something that's happened quite recently. I know many people may disagree, but my office has decided to prosecute a federal law enforcement officer. We prosecute people depending on the evidence. That individual, the federal law enforcement officer, he had a gun, Didi had a gun, shot an unarmed local resident. People may disagree with us, but we looked at the evidence and we are, we, it doesn't matter who it is, we will prosecute. Thank you, Dwight. Uh, next, RJ Brown. So the, the, the numbers certainly uh, prove that there is a disproportionate number of Native Hawaiians that are incarcerated in the state of Hawaii. That's just, just a fact. Um, now, what I would suggest and what I think is probably true is that there are a number of factors um, that, that have led to that. And if there's gonna be a candidate that's gonna sit here and tell you in the face, hey, I've got the answer and I can tell you exactly why and it's racism, um, I think that that's, they're probably trying to sell you something. And could that be a component? Absolutely. Are there implicit biases uh, that we all maintain as, as people growing up in Hawaii? Absolutely. Um, can we do better as a prosecutor's office to ensure more objectivity, uh, more higher ethical standards? Of course we can. Uh, but when you're, when you're asking about this question and when we're thinking about it, you know, you got to understand that we're trying to be the prosecutor and the role of the prosecutor is limited and distinct. And what we do is we look at evidence and we charge cases and we prosecute those cases. And so the best thing that you can do 
If you want to reduce disproportionate incarceration rates, if you want to make the prison system better, if you want to make the criminal justice system more fair, is you've got to elect somebody that has ethics, that is a person of integrity, that's going to do the right thing. And they're going to require their deputies to do the right thing, which means that you take race out of the analysis. You take uh, any, any category, anything that is not relevant to whether or not a crime has been committed with the requisite state of mind, that, that it should all be set aside. We're about doing the right thing every single day in every single case. Thank you, RJ. Ty Kim. Thank you for the question. Do I think there's a systematic systemic racism? Do I, do I believe there's a sort of uh, biases? Definitely. Most people take it for granted that we live in Hawaii. Hawaii is a melting pot of the world. Not just most, most, not just mostly isolated or the most isolated part of the world, but Hawaii has every ethnicity of the world. It's it's a melting pot. We have every every culture. However, to say that there is no racism, there is no <laughs> bias, that's absolutely untrue. There is a systemic bias and prejudice in every level of our society. I'm talking about Honolulu, Hawaii. I grew up here in Kalihi, as well as in Kaneohe. My, I have friends who are of different, dif, dif, different, different ethnicity, and they're great people, but every one of us, we're human beings. We have our own biases and prejudices and our own opinions. To say there isn't, it, it's just simply false. We need education. We need to educate the people. We need to better train the police officers to recognize it. And of course, within the prosecutor's office, I will have the deputies always be cognizant of systemic biases so that there won't be any uh, unfair prosecution. There won't be any playing with politics. It applies to everybody, immigrants, rich, poor, new to the community, old Thank to the community. Time. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, Anosh Yaku. Hello, yes. Uh, concerning this topic, I, I, more, I more or less agree with the idea that I'm not sure we have systemic institutional racism at work, but I do believe we have more subtle, implicit biases. And I would agree, tend to agree that although Hawaii is a melting pot, um, I do believe we have racism, racism here as well. It takes several different shapes and forms and it's pervasive and uh, pervades our society. It's, it's no good. Uh, but I believe that people can trust that if they elect me, if they put their trust in me, that they can trust 100% that I would certainly not be targeting any particular group and that they would find that it's really just about applying the law even handedly and leading where the evidence will lead you, going where the evidence will lead you. I am of the belief in particular that there probably isn't much that can be done to change the public's perception on this, except to elect somebody like myself, somebody who is from the outside, somebody who's not an insider, somebody who hasn't had a career in government. This is gonna take time. I believe that recently, the events surrounding the Honolulu Police Department and surrounding the Honolulu Prosecutor's Office have shaken public confidence. They've shaken public confidence in law enforcement and our structural uh, institutions to the core. It's going to take time. That's pretty much the only answer I can come up with. I don't think there's a band-aid. I don't think there's a quick fix. I don't think there's any rubbing you, alcohol Anosh. or scoring for this. I, I believe this is going to take time. Thank you, Anosh. And Jackie Esser, I want to make sure to give you guys time for closing. Ask Micronesians if racism exists here. To say Hawaii is unique and colorblind is proof, systemic, implicit, explicit racism exists in our criminal legal system. In Hawaii, with its history of colonization, the criminal legal system has operated to dislodge the claims of Native Hawaiians. The blind objectivity, ob objectivity that it has, is being discussed here tonight has been used as a weapon against our Native Hawaiians, our Pacific Islanders, our Black, Brown, Brown and Indigenous, since the beginning of the colonization here in Hawaii and slavery on the continent. Look who fills our jails and prisons. Native Hawaiians make up 18% of the adult population and over 40% of our prison populations. Studies show they're overrepresented at every single stage. The Office of Hawaiian Affairs have been documenting this for years. 
What is racism? The fact that our leaders have not done anything to end it. Thank Under you. My, I, I'm sorry, can I finish? Just, sure. I want to give some examples. Wrap up. Okay. Um, examples of it is cash bail. Cash bail punishes the poor and it, it creates two systems of justice. Also, the ACLU recently took the arrest records during the quarantine violations. Micronesians were arrested 30% more than, not, than their white counterpart that for, who were cited, who were just giving a citation. It absolutely exists. The prosecutor, you have to elect a prosecutor who understands this, not only understands it, who on day one will work to end it. Thank you, Jackie. And finally, Steve Ohm. Thank you. Uh... Our police department, law enforcement, and made up of human beings. There will be racists there. Uh, is it really widespread? Are a lot of police officers that way? I don't, I don't think so. At the same time, implicit bias certainly exists. I took that training when I was a judge. I think law enforcement should take it. I think the prosecutor's office, I'll have the deputies take it as well. But what are the practical things we can do? run an ethical office. So from charging to trials to appeals, sentencing, it's done in a colorblind, non-discriminatory fashion. Fashion. We should also support the efforts in the, in the judiciary to help people of all races. And so we, between drug court, mental health court, hope probation, we now have strategies where research, Hawaii research has shown Native Hawaiians get revoked and go to prison half as often. That means hundreds of Native Hawaiians have not gone to prison. And for serious misconduct, when I was the United States Attorney, we charged, investigated, investigated, charged, and convicted Honolulu police officers for civil rights violations and for corruptions, and they went to federal prison. And as the U.S. Attorney, I brought in a new age of working closely with the Honolulu Police Department. They worked on task forces with the federal agencies. That was the best outcomes. So. Uh, we prosecuted whoever needed to be prosecuted, and I would do that as the Honolulu prosecutor. Thank you, Steve. Okay, we're going to give everybody a chance for closing. We've got about six minutes, so it's going to be, have to be less than a minute. You keep it to, say, five seconds, three to five points, and we're going to start first with R.J. Brown. Well, thank you guys for having this, uh, this event. We always appreciate it, and, uh, you know, listen, voters have a big choice ahead of them. Um, there, there are big issues that need to be dealt with. The criminal justice system needs reformation. We need to come up with alternatives uh, for how we treat addicts, for how we treat mental health issues. We need to minimize our use of incarceration as sort of our, our de facto go-to tool in every scenario. Uh, now that said, um, look, this is an application to become the prosecutor. Um, there are a lot of defense attorneys in this, in this race here, and I respect these people. They are smart, they are competent, and they've got a job to do. Uh, but what we need is someone who believes in victim rights. We need somebody who believes in accountability. We need someone who's got a proven track record of going to trial, taking tough cases, and representing actual victims. Because what we've got is a defense-oriented community, and you need that, that tough advocate that's going to get there, make the case, and get the job done the right way. Uh, if you thank give you. me this opportunity, oh, I guess, thank you. Thank you, RJ. Dwight Nadamoto. Eight months ago, our city was in the midst of a crime wave. I sat there and watched, and I didn't see anybody who had public safety as their main reason. I looked around, and I saw Steve Baum, the founder of Hope Probation. Hope Probation is not about public safety. Hope Probation is about giving felons chance after chance after chance. Stephen Brown on Hope Probation, when he is alleged to have killed uh, Thelma Boyneville. Jackie Esther, she represents cops and murders. Nobody is focusing on public safety. Jackie Esther, she's the one who was for COVID-19 release. I was the only one who was against the premature release of inmates due to an alleged threat of COVID-19. Nobody I, I saw was interested in public safety, and that is why I decided to run. Thank you, Dwight. Um, and that is going to be um, Ty Kim. This is Ty Kim. I'm in my mid-50s, so always my home. I grew up at KPT, Cuyo Park Terrace in Kalihi, and in Kanioi. I attended Fern Elementary, where I got my lickens. First slow dance with Miss Suzuki at Camp Erdman, and my first kiss. Now with Mrs. Suzuki. I grew up listening to Peter Moon Band, Kalapana, and Kapena. I graduated from Castle High School in Kanioi. 
nominate, nominated to West Point by Native Hawaiian, attended college at UH. With the help of Japanese American, both my brother and I went to law school and became lawyers. I got married here. Both my girls are born and raised here. This is my home, my only home. I will live and die here. Give me ai pokey and la la and I don't need anything else. I'm a product of all the generosity from every ethnicity in Hawaii. This is our home. We will make it stronger, safer, and more informed. Thank you. Thank you, Ty. We've got three minutes or less. Okay, next we've got um, Steve Ong. This election is all about restoring trust to the prosecutor's office, and I'm the person to do it. I have spent 31 years protecting the people of the state of Hawaii, and Dwight Nadamoto is either misinformed or he's trying to mislead you. The research shows hope probationers get arrested for new crimes 55% less often than regular probation. They go to prison half as often. Elect a, a person who's been a prosecutor, who's been a judge, who can work with communities like we did in Kali Palama in Chinatown to reduce crime there by over 70%. This is no time for on the job training. Apart from Dwight Nadamoto, nobody here has supervised anybody and has not supervised any prosecutors or led them in any way. I will do that. I will restore trust to that office. I'll train the deputies to be more effective in court and will protect the people of Honolulu. Thank you. Thank you, Steve. Anosh. Aloha. Thank you for having this forum. I'm gonna to try to go as quickly as I can. I would like to speak to, towards a number of issues, towards a couple of issues, briefly. First, I wanna thank everyone who voted for me in 2016. This is a great time. I, I would urge you to feel good. I would urge you to enjoy this as much as I have been. This is an invigorating time. I'm gonna urge all of the people who voted for me in 2016, let's run it back. Let's do it one more time. Let's show everyone on August, in August, let's, let's show everyone again. And I promise you, if you give me your vote, I will not disappoint you. Now, I do wanna mention, and I believe this to be true, that we are at an inflection point. This is a time to go forward, not a time to go backward. This is not a time to go back to the Kaneshiro tree or the Carlisle tree. This is a time for us to plant our own tree, to start a new relationship with someone, to start something brand new. I, can't, I cannot think of a bigger disaster than to elect Keith Kaneshiro's hand-picked successor. I believe that would be disastrous for our city. I believe that it would be disastrous for the credibility of the prosecutor's office. And I humbly appreciate your vote. Remember, every passing minute is a chance for us to turn it all around. Thanks. Jackie, yes, sir. Um, and we were going to have to go quickly. First and foremost, I'm a mother. And I want nothing more than a safe community to raise my daughter in. For the sake of our children and their children, we must do everything to end mass incarceration. It's time we start investing in our communities and our families in crime prevention and stop investing in our jails and prisons. This will not happen if we keep electing prosecutors who think that the status quo is acceptable. Prosecutors who have been profiting from and entrenched in our current system and mentality that has led us to incarcerate thousands of our citizens and fail to make us safer. I'm glad people are joining me to the table now and talking about much needed reform, but it's going to take fundamental transformational reform. I have been doing this my entire legal career. I will be ready on day one to lead the office into a more fair and just office and into the 21st century and beyond. Thank you, Hawaii Women Lawyers and Hawaii Tech and Think Tech for having this important conversation and for your work in leading the way. All of the candidates here are very qualified and would do an excellent job, but we need to get away from Keith Kanashiro. Dwight Naramoto followed Keith Kanashiro to the prosecutor's office in the 1980s and then again in 2010. Keith Kanashiro handpicked Dwight Naramoto to run this office. Steve Alm also worked for Keith Kanashiro for six years and was promoted to be a supervisor under Keith. I believe that a prosecutor's duty is to objectively apply the criminal laws to anyone that violates the law. And if you violate the law, I will prosecute you, whether Hawaiian or not Hawaiian, local or not local, rich or poor. We need an objective prosecutor and we need a fresh new start. Thank you, everybody. And just remember that this has been recorded. 
Um, we are streaming online, and so you can tell your friends and supporters to uh, check online for uh, at HWL and Think Tech Hawaii, I believe. So thank you, everybody.